welcome back on Franchi Talks Japanese. I'm, I'm Franchi and I'm back with a new video today. And today's video will combine two lovely topics. The one of the tea ceremony and the one of food. So we will look at the meal that takes place during the tea ceremony and specifically we will look at a set of little dishes that is used to serve food during the ceremony. And this set is from the collection of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And it will be an interesting journey because we will go from the Netherlands to Japan, exploring also a little bit of Chinese influence. So I recommend that you stay tuned. And if, uh, like many other of my videos, this ends up being a little bit long, don't worry, you don't have to watch it all in one go. And I will make sure to put timestamps in the description so you can click them and skip around the video. So I hope you stick around and let's jump right in. So the mukozuke should be appearing all around me and we can have a good look at them. They are quite small, they are in the shape of a square with about 7 cm of diameter or 5 cm of height. And we can see they are white in the background on their body with a decoration in blue and the decoration is of a plant motif and a few animals like birds and insects. Actually it's really <laughs> simple but I also find it delightful, like quite refreshing. It makes me think of the of nature. But it is also quite rustic, it's not extremely elaborate or especially fine detail work. And we cannot see very well unfortunately, but there is also decoration inside which is is again a plant motif and we can also see that there is like some finishing lines at the top and at the bottom there is like a line that makes a little frame for the decoration and we said that these mukuzuke they are dishes so they are used during tea ceremony but they are not used for drinking tea actually they are used to eat from them to serve food and this might come as a little surprise <laughs> maybe I don't know for a few viewers because the tea ceremony does not only include drinking tea, but actually it includes quite a bit of eating <laughs> and uh, the how much eating or what kind of eating <laughs> is done during the ceremony, well, that depends on the length of it because different rituals can be followed that have a different length and therefore include the different action. So, to give you a kind of idea, I will describe now the structure of a full-length tea ceremony so you can understand what kind of eating and drinking happens during it. So the ceremony starts when the guests enter the tea room and the tea master is waiting for them and the first thing that happens is that they are served a meal, a very light, simple meal and they eat it um, Together, each person is served on a tray, and the tea master, he has he or she has specifically prepared this meal for them. And after the meal, they are also served some little sweets. And after eating these sweets, they are asked to leave the room. And during this time alone in the tea room, the tea master makes sure to tidy up and clean up while the guests are in the garden, usually in the garden. <laughs> and when the host, the tea master, asks them to come in again, the guests re-enter the room. And it is at this point that what happens is what we usually conceive of the, as the main, the main action, the main ritual of the tea ceremony, which is the drinking of the tea. The tea master prepares what is called a strong tea, which is served in one single bowl and this bowl is shared throughout all of the guests. This tea is also accompanied by some sweets because it, it, it's quite strong, quite bitter, so the sweets mellow its taste. And after this, uh, the drinking of this tea, there is again another break, but during this break, the, the guests they stay in the tea room and what happens is that they have a little bit of time to let's say appreciate the aesthetic of the tea ceremony because at this point they can have a look at the objects that the 
tea master has used to prepare the tea so they can look at the bowl they can look at the little whisk and they can have a look at what kind of artworks the tea master has decided to hang in the tea room that day so it's a little aesthetic break and after that they are served tea again but this time it's a lighter tea and again this one is also served with some sweet and that's the <laughs> after that it's the end and they get may leave we already mentioned that the meal that is served during the tea ceremony is a light and simple meal and this idea of simplicity of it can also be found in the Japanese words that are used to, to call it, to indicate it. So usually it's called cha kaiseki or kaiseki glory. And if we analyze these words, we can first of all take the word glory, it just means cuisine or cooking. And then we are left with cha kaiseki. Cha, I mentioned it maybe in another video already, it means tea. And kaiseki is actually the most interesting words of these because kai means chest and seki means rock. And so we can roughly translate it as the cuisine of the rocks on the chest. And this comes from a tradition from the Buddhist monasteries, especially Zen Buddhism, where monks would be very concentrated in their meditation. And, but sometimes they would get hungry and hunger could distract them from meditating. So what they would do was to take some warm rocks and place them over near their bellies and keep them tied to their body. So the worms would tame their hunger and the hunger would no longer distract them and they could continue to meditate. So in general, <laughs> this uh, gives us an idea of something a little bit poor, a little bit humble, just like Zen Buddhism and just like the tea ceremony. And the meal, it doesn't only convey the idea of simplicity, but it is uh, useful to convey a number of ideas which are entrenched in the tea ceremony. So first we find this, uh, the first idea that we can look at is this kind of atmosphere of welcoming. And the meal, it represents this welcoming because it's prepared from the host for the guests and he puts a lot of care in preparing it, so it creates this atmosphere. The second idea which is conveyed by the meal, I think it's that of aesthetic appreciation because we mentioned it before in other videos as well, the tea ceremony is not only um, a ritual in which you drink tea, and it's not only, it has a religious meaning, but not only. And one of the various meanings that it has is that of aesthetic, of an aesthetic experience. And the, the meal is served in a very aesthetic way, very pleasant to look at. And it's served on specific trays or dishes, which are also beautiful and unique, and which certainly convey an aesthetic appreciation to the tea ceremony. The host chooses them specifically to create certain feelings within the guests and so the guests also when they see them they appreciate this effort. And all of this conveys the most important ideal of the tea ceremony which is Ichigo Ichie in Japanese which means one time, one meeting. So when the tea master, the host creates this atmosphere of welcoming and puts so much effort into the aesthetic ideas of it, in how the tea ceremony will look and creates this meal, every time it will be unique with his effort and he's gonna choose different objects, different foods and also the relationship between the host and the guest is gonna be different, it's gonna be unique, a special bond will be created. And maybe it's gonna always be a slightly different season or a different weather and he, the tea master will choose certain items, certain art objects to show on the wall, on the tokonoma and so it's gonna be unique, it's gonna be different. But if we go back to our mokozuke 
we can actually ask ourselves how are they actually used in tea ceremony. I talked a lot about their ideas, but how are they practically used? So during the meal of the tea ceremony, the mukuzuke are usually placed on a tray accompanied by other dishes. Now the meal can follow a specific formula or a few specific formulas. There is the ichiju sansai, which means one soup and three main dishes or when the tea master wants to create a certain specific focus on simplicity, he can choose to follow the formula of Ichiju Isai, which means one soup and one main dish. But in general, the meals are served on a tray. The tea master prepares an individual tray for each guest, and he can serve up to two trays for each guest and the mukotsuke they are placed on the tray. Now, when they are placed on the tray, um, I will explain this with my words, but I will also put a picture up because it's immediate to see and a little bit more complicated to explain. <laughs> so he's gonna place them on the tray and he's gonna place on the side that is closer to the guest one bowl of rice and one bowl of soup. And then he's beyond them, on the other side, further away from the guest, he will play the, place the mukozuke. And this is where the name mukozuke comes from, because mukozuke means to be placed beyond. But going back from a more practical use of the mukozuke to a more theoretical one, let's say, or aesthetic one, we can say that the mukozuke, they really worked when the team master was trying to create an effect of unicity in the tea ceremony. In effect, collaborating with craftsmen, the tea masters started, let's say, designing or using or adopting um, a number of mukozuke of various shapes and colors. Because when used, using this mukozuke, with its shape and texture and color and with different foods which also have different textures and colors and perhaps even smells in them, it could create at least a feeling of surprise in the guests, a feeling which surely the guests would remember and would, which would create a sense of unicity of the tea ceremony. In fact, the tea masters, they often did not use the same plates or the same dishes with the same foods for the same guests. And also the mukozuke that we are looking at today, I think they also do a great job in eliciting a feeling of surprise in the guests. So let's look at why and to show you why I'm gonna take you on a little trip. So come with me. Today we are now in the town of Delft in the Netherlands and you can see by the canal it's typically Dutch and you might be wondering why I'm filming this here. Now we looked at some of the, our little dishes and if we look at them we see that they are white and blue and I'm sure that people are watching a video about ceramics and the tea ceremony have surely seen white and blue ceramics or porcelain before. And usually we know them as Chinese or Japanese. The Chinese actually started making porcelain in the 14th century and the, and the Japanese followed around the 17th century. And Chinese and the blue and white was very popular both in China and Japan and in the 17th century it became very popular in Europe. And the Dutch was, were actually the ones that had the best commercial relationship with both China and Japan and they imported into Europe a huge amount of porcelain. But around the half of the 17th century there were some political disturbances in China and this uh, made it happen that they couldn't produce as much porcelain as before and less porcelain was therefore imported into Europe. And when I say less porcelain, it's a bit of a euphemism 
because according to some Dutch sources, the amount of porcelain which was brought into Europe went from a quarter of a million pieces a year to just a few, like the, you could count a handful. So the, the, the porcelain imported was much less, but not was the request from European families and the population. And so what happened? Around the same time, the town of Delft became famous for its production of ceramics. In the past, Delft was known for its breweries, but as you can see, there is a lot of water here. But um, with time, the water of the canals became very polluted and it couldn't be used to make beer anymore. And what happened is that many cera ceramists moved into Delft and started making ceramics here because there was empty space in buildings from the previous breweries <laughs> and because of uh, the amount of water it was useful to make ceramics and the canals were useful to transport ceramics throughout the country and what they started making with time was also a type of white and blue and this white and blue it wasn't porcelain because Europeans didn't know how to make that. It was uh, made in China and then it was made in Korea and in Japan, but the Europeans didn't know what to use. What you, you, what you need is a specific type of clay called cowding, and that wasn't found in Europe until later in the 18th century in uh, Germany, uh, in the town of Meissen, they learned how to make that. But at the time in the Netherlands, that wasn't known. How to make porcelain was a secret. And so what the Dutch did was getting some regular earthenware and then bake it and then cover it with a tin glaze which made it, which made it look white and paint it with blue over it. And they sold it as white and blue porcelain even though it was a fake. And the reason why we are talking about all of this is because the little dishes that we looked at today in the video were actually made here. They were made in Delft, they are Delftware by definition, and then they were brought all the way to Japan to be used in a tea ceremony. So at first I asked myself, how did uh, such Dutch objects end up you being used in Japan in the tea ceremony? Usually what we always hear about or read about is the opposite happening, like I mentioned, a lot of uh, Japanese and Chinese ceramics or Asian ceramics in general being imported into Europe but we don't really hear or read much about European ceramics going to Asia and why, how it happened was that uh, as we mentioned the Dutch had uh, the best economic relationships relationship with Japan in the 17th century actually they were the only economic part partners <laughs> who were allowed to travel to Japan to go onto Japanese land and acquire merchandise to bring back into Europe. And this started in 1609, this unique relationship. But every time the Dutch traders went to Japan, actually they weren't allowed to travel anywhere in the country. They had to reside in a very specific place, which is the island of Deshima. Only once a year, Dutch traders could leave Deshima and they traveled all the way to the capital Edo, today Tokyo. And the reason why they went there was to kind of ratify their commercial relationship. And when they went to Edo, they would bring presents with them. And these presents, they were actually often requested by the Japanese quite specifically and actually European ceramics were often part of these requests. The Japanese would request items to the Dutch, we would then register in what they called Aish Buchen, and these books, these lists would be brought back to the Netherlands, all the items would be acquired and shipped again to Japan. And what the Japanese did was often requesting ceramics, actually the Shogun himself, Tokugawa Yemitsu, asked for several ceramics, for example, in 1641. And they didn't just ask for the items, like, oh, what kind of item I would like, but they actually sometimes gave models made of 
wood or actually even ceramics to show exactly what they wanted and then their models will be sent to the Netherlands and Dutch ceramists would copy the model with their own clay and then send them back. And this is what probably happened with our Mukozuke because there are no such similar items in the depth repertoire. We don't see this shape ever. But we see it in other Japanese objects like several mukozuke that have a different colors or a different clay but it, that is the same shape so probably the someone in Tokyo or someone in Japan requested this sent uh, gave to the Dutch a model to copy the Dutch brought it back to Delft it was made somewhere around here and then it was sent to Japan so <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this little trip to, to Delft with me it's really a delightful place, <laughs> and uh, but now let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to when we talked about the feeling of unicity and surprise in the tea ceremony, and I think this totally applies to our mukozuke because we have to think that these objects were as rare and designed in Japan as much as Japanese or Chinese ceramic was in Europe and they would have been probably kind of rare so to dish them out <laughs> to say so during a tea ceremony surely the guests would have a feeling of awe when seeing them and this it probably wouldn't have seen these objects many times before or after that and so they would surely make a great impression in their memories and that's why I love looking at them because I feel like these such small objects can carry so many fascinations, so many feelings within them. They were the object of a global trade and we can see that they were European ceramics inspired by a Chinese look but then also desired and commissioned by the Japanese to be used in their own tea ceremony and in a way they embodied all these ideas of this ceremony so i think they're really fantastic in this way and i of course i hope that you also think that i hope that i could convey with you why i love them actually i saw these objects like at least two years ago on the website of the Rijks museum and i couldn't take them out of my head and i'm glad that i finally had the time to look into them and to share my findings with you so I hope that to see you again soon with my next video and if you would like you can always subscribe to my channel or follow me on my Facebook or Instagram the links to those will be in the description down below so you can keep up with me and keep in touch and of course I would love to hear from you if you have ideas for other videos what you would like me to talk about or if you want to see more videos about this and a unique relationship between Japan and the Netherlands. And so, hope to see you again soon. Bye!